uh, Irene should be ready to go, and then we can have further discussion at the end of the session if we have any time left. Uh, Irene, John is going to introduce you to uh, our meeting. So wonderful to have you with us. Thank you, John. Yes, well, thank you, Michael. Uh, welcome, Irene. Um, Professor Hello. Irene Lang. Um, she is professor at the Medical University of Vienna, lovely Vienna in Austria. Uh, and uh, she's a busy interventional cardiologist, but she also has time to be one of the uh, absolute leading lights in the pulmonary hypertension world. Uh, she has a wide range of interests uh, from the basic science underpinning the mechanisms of pulmonary vascular occlusion to pioneering balloon angioplasty in, uh, as a developing treatment for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And um, she'll speak to us today about balloon angioplasty for pulmonary thrombosis. Thank you, Irene. Well, thank you. I'd like to uh, thank you for the very kind introduction. And I'm really honored to be here and uh, to talk to you about balloon pulmonary angioplasty. Can you see the, the, the slides? Yes, can we can. Can you see them well? Great. Yes, we because can. Because I, I cannot check that. So the, uh, the topic is um, uh, started in 2014 in my life and since then has changed my life a lot because I do a lot of this work and um, I um, remember that the roots, in at least in Europe, came from pediatric interventionists and I will come back to that. So on this slide you see in the left upper and the right upper corner a, a 10 segment of a pulmonary artery, very big, it's 14 millimeter right there. And um, we were able to open that up in an inoperable patient. So here's my disclosures. I have disclosures with companies that have to do with pulmonary hypertension and uh, vascular medicine in general. So the WHO classification of pulmonary hypertension has in the group four, which is, which is shown here, the conditions of pulmonary hypertension due to pulmonary artery obstructions. And it's, it's quite wide, uh, understanding a number of different conditions, the main being chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. But there's also other obstructions. And as you go down the list, there is also congenital pulmonary artery stenosis. What is not here and what will be here at the next uh, revision will be peripheral pulmonary stenosis, which is an Asian co uh, condition. I've also seen it in, in, in middle of Europe. And um, basically the two conditions, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension and congenital pulmonary artery stenosis slash PPS, peripheral pulmonary stenosis, which is probably not congenital, it's thought to be due to uh, viral disease, those are amenable to balloon pulmonary angioplasty. Uh, to illustrate the, the two different domains here, I, I've chosen this example that was shared uh, by Hiroto Shimo Kawahara from um, Okayama, where I learned a lot of uh, my interventional uh, expertise. So the two ladies, Two have positive perfusion centigrams, wedge-shaped defects pointing to major vessel pulmonary artery obstruction, group four pulmonary hypertension. So if you look at them more closely, and this is here on the left side, uh, a pulmonary angiogram, and on the right side, a pulmonary angiogram, and the diagnosis is at, at the top of the two angiograms. Those are the gold standard for interventional cardiologists at least, but we are learning of course to use other domains, but let me stay with pulmonary angiography for now. You see the uh, vascular occlusions on the, on the left panel like here, uh, and um, it, it looks like the coronary artery stenosis lesion types. While on the right side you have total occlusions as shown up here, blunt end occlusions, you have webs and bands and obstructions and tapered occlusions. So more the occlusive type with residual flow. So it looks similar, but if you look at, at the pathology, and I, I kind of believe in pathology to help us learn 
on the right on the left side it's an intimal hyperplastic disease looks like a coronary and, uh, artery cross section but it's from a per patient with peripheral pulmonary stenosis on the right side a web that is uh, filling out, up the vessel while the medial layer and the intimal layer are not so thick and there's on the left while you need stents on the left side, as you create instant re uh, in, in lesion restenosis with a balloon, you don't need that on the right side as you break the webs and don't hurt the intimal layer and don't activate embryonic genes to cause intimal hyperplasia. Two different conditions. On the left side, branch stenosis, peripheral pulmonary stenosis needs a stent on the right side. CTEPH, intravascular webs, with some integration in the intima, but you never break the intima and cause restenosis. So having said that, I will be focusing on CTEPH because this is where I have expertise and where uh, I've learned to, from my colleagues to help patients. So we're talking about a pulmonary hypertension that's mostly precapillary, not necessarily, that is classified into um, a major vessel obstructive disorder with different lesions. Uh, they are seen on CT scan on pulmonary angiography. VQ is the screening and the, the definition is by CT scan on angiography. And you need six month, three months of effective anticoagulation to be able to make the diagnosis. So here's the 2001 publication of Jeffrey Feinstein and this group had did a lot of pediatric angioplasty and they took their expertise to, to the population of CTEPH and didn't have these great results really. The paper at the time was, was uh, not so well received in the CTEF community. I do remember that, particularly not by the surgeons. And it was argued that it didn't work well. In 2019, we do, see, we do BPA I plane, at least I do, eight French, uh, I, I telescope a short tip guiding in there, then a six French guiding in there, and then I use some guideline extensions and microcatheters. We pass Coumadin, we use 50-50 contrast by hand injection. We use any wires, usually hard wires, I have to say, I don't use soft wires. We use compliant balloons, uh, and I mentioned the guideline or the guideline extension, not much imaging. Uh, I, we, we look to lower the mean pressure as much as possible in the young and in the elderly we are less ambitious. This is the setup. This is a little manifold where we mix the contrast with the uh, sodium chloride at 50-50 to, to save contrast and we, we do soft injections. We always do complete assessments prior to every BPA session with 30 minutes radiation, 200 contrast. We anticipate several sessions. We, we, we put them in close proximity at the beginning and then uh, intervals are widening afterwards. We deal with complex lesions later and we keep coming back until we are satisfied with the approach. And this is the key interventional view that, that is published and I like to use to clarify uh, what CTEF is all about. It's a web disease. It's not like PPS. It's a different condition. In the 2015 treatment algorithm as shown here, the, the labeling is 1C pulmonary endodirectomy first, targeted medical second, and PPA is the, the last option, has most recently been suggested to make it a 2A, but there isn't any new guidelines as yet. The surgical view shown here, the level one, two, three, and four disease where the surgeon basically tunnels out and endorectomizes the material. Um, and we go in, we don't take anything out. We just break the webs that are in the way of flow. And I think it's an, a very ingenious idea because it's all about flow. Uh, survival in operated is much better, as you can see here. Uh, compared with uh, not operated patients. This is very clear. So if you take out the obstructions, it's much better. But about 50% remain unoperated. Maybe in, in London, in the center, it's, it's only 35%. But worldwide, it's about half of the patients. And then there is a number of patients who have uh, 
pulmonary hypertension after pulmonary endarterectomy. This is an illustration of the principle of BPA. I mentioned that you have here a, uh, an A9 segment, use it for overloan, and you push the material to the side, as shown here by the OCT cross-sectional images. I think it's a very nice uh, um, uh, little butt shape here that is pushed to the side, so it's, you can follow the structure as it is moved to the side. The current BPA strategy is uh, taught worldwide by Professor Hiromi Matsubara, whose image is in this slide. In contrast to the pulmonary endarterectomy, which is a single time major surgery going through all the segments here, BPA is adding segment by segment, side by side, until you get a uh, satisfactory result. And that is illustrated on this slide, and I like to use it. It's, uh, it's a textbook slide where you have a prior image after BPA and the three months later, and you can see how the distal pressure shown in red and the and the proximal pressure shown in blue are diminishing and basically the gap is closing. Some people use the gap as a stimulus to do more dilatations. Usually I don't because it takes time and you want to just do as much as you can within the time frame that you have. The, uh, the lesions as we see them are shown here with, with uh, stenosis, web veins, occlusions, tortuous lesions and um, uh, they, they determine the outcomes. So the, the more complicated lesions uh, uh, will be, uh, have, have to be treated with more caution compared with the simple lesions such as the webs and the ring-like stenosis. So this is an example of a chronic total occlusion. Um, you see that we use hard wires here, the, the balloon crosses and then you gain significant amount of lung in terms of capillary surface. We've uh, recently studied that. It's not published yet, but it seems that as much as CTO lesions you treat, as much are you able to favor the treatment response def defined here as PDR change. And this is a commonly used endpoint of studies. So this is, uh, wasn't previously the case. We also see, of course, complications. We, there's no procedure without any complications, and that is mainly lung injury with all the features that, um, that go back to a simple um, um, uh, disruption of, of the vascular integrity. It starts with hypoxemia. It's very subtle. One has to watch out. If a patient <clears throat> does this during procedure, I, I say, are you okay? And I, I wait and, and maybe prevent. So reperfusion is probably not so important, although it may occur if one is very efficiently working. Outcomes are summarized on this slide. I have summarized the French reference center that published their results of um, a thousand procedures in 2019. The Japanese was published in 2017 and the German experience, you can see that the mean pressure goes down significantly as well as uh, the cardiac index increases more in the European than in the Japanese for some reason. So where does BPA for CTEF stand today? It's a team approach. It's uh, still second best after pulmonary endarterectomy. Uh, it is um, not so clear what the, what, which exact role medical therapy plays with, it, with the interventional techniques. Uh, very likely multimodality treatment will be succeeding. The International BPA Registry tries to capture all these uh, developments worldwide and uh, has now closed the patient uh, recruitment. So in conclusion, I would like to remind you that balloon pulmonary angioplasty is an effective percutaneous intervention for pulmonary arteries, also for pulmonary veins, by the way. It is, um, there is a branch stenosis, BPA, and PPS BPA. They need to be concluded by stenting. Uh, but in, in terms of CTEF, BPA doesn't need stents. It's mainly uh, performed without stents. 
It's an effective procedure. It decreases mean pressure by 32 plus percent, PBR by 50 percent, uh, low complication rates between 1 and 10 percent of cases, 30 day mortality below 2 percent, and uh, international BPA registry will provide insights into practice, safety, and outcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Irene. It looks like someone's coming to try and get you in the in the in the. In yeah, the... no. Be careful. <laughs> I cannot. I cannot help. I'm in the hospital. You know, <laughs> passing on it. Somebody. <laughs> that was a wonderful talk. Thank you very much, Mike, Michael. I don't know whether should we get everyone together for questions now, or, or um, how do you want to play it? I think we should share a few questions because this is hot now, particularly Irene's presentation. So. Yeah. So I was going to. I was going to ask. You know. In in five years, how do you how do you think the landscape will have changed in terms of um, BPA versus oh, pulmonary and arterectomy? You know, I, I think I know. You know, there will be a small study comparing PEA and BPA, and it will be showing non inferiority of BPA, but it will be in a in a very clearly defined patient population, and it will be argued that it will not change that the fact that main pulmonary artery disease is a domain for the surgeons. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, you know that it's it's like, um, I think it's 40, 60, 40% 40 are really main. So there, but, but it will split. So there will be, um, there will be a PA first, but for a large proportion of patients, it will be, much equal, you know, and maybe in some instances, CTEF teams will decide to do PA first, then BPA, and all around this medical. I think it will be a, a challenge for CTEF teams, and if they are smart teams, they use their tools, I think. <laughs> Very wise. Uh, just another question um, about um, chronic thromboembolic disease, so that's where, where people don't develop, haven't developed pulmonary hypertension, but still have the vascular uh, occlusions and abnormalities, but are, are, are breathless. Do you see um, this technique expanding into that area? Because that's obviously could be a, a large yeah, number. Of I think so. I think it will, uh, because it's, um, remember the, the uh, publication from Papworth on, on, uh, on the CTED cases who underwent pulmonary and arterectomy, there was no mortality, but mm. there were complications. So you have to, of course, BPA has complications. So the question is, um, m m much of those complications were atrial fibrillation, I remember. Um, if the complication rate keeps going down with more practice, I think those will be very comparable techniques in this very specific subset of patients. Although, yeah. In the unilateral occlusion cases, I think BPA has no place. It will it will remain a PA uh, indication. Okay. And okay. many of the CTEPs, you have to say now CTEP, which is <laughs> terrible. I think. Um, many of the CTEP cases, I think, um, some of them are unilateral occlusion. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Just having a look to see if there are any questions from the from uh, from the audience. Um, I had another one actually because it seems to be that um, that there is progressive improvement over time after you've you've performed the angioplasty. What do you think is going on there? That's a good question. You know, the, the Okayama Group has published a paper on sequential IVAS uh, studies. And they are showing that the reference diameter is increasing over time. So there seems to be a remodeling process that's driven by the flow. And I think pediatric cardiologists know this much better than we do. But there is something like a flow-driven remodeling. I think it's very interesting. Yeah, it's very becoming really big. I mean, you've probably seen it in your patients. If you bring them back three months later, it's like... Yeah, you yeah. don't recognize anatomy. It's so big. Mm. It has completely changed. I think so, it's an interesting remodeling process. Mm. Very good, Michael. Quite remarkable. 
and a beautiful talk. And uh, Irene, with Jane Summer, who gave us some wisdom during the lunch break. Maybe one could say that there's no single technique that completely replaces what there is over there, but it complements it. But it'd be nice to see how it evolves. This is fantastic. I think we should uh, call it uh, a day so we can give to our delegates and our faculty a 10 minute refreshment break before we start prom promptly at uh, 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 3.30 because people may have to catch their plane to fly back to their destination. <laughs> <laughs> it used to be what you used to say, but it'd be nice to finish on time. Fantastic. Uh, thank uh, you. Talk. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Ari. Yeah, thank wonderful. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Have a great and, and way and to you. But probably you'll stay with the next uh, session. Thank you very much.